It is a backward turning connection, like that of the bow and the lyre. So, as in war, so in heart. I think Heraclitus is telling us a productive tension is everything. For the essence of the bow, to be used in competition and to be used in war, and the essence of the lion, to be used in celebrating competition and celebrating war and celebrating everything else through art. The essence of the bow and the lion is tension. In the instrument of warfare, so in the instrument of artistic creation, tension is everything. And I think it's against this Heraclitian background that Nietzsche's pronouncements about war, otherwise so grievously open to misinterpretation, are to be understood. And of course, many things we can say about Nietzsche, but he knew his Heraclitus. <laughs> In Zarathustra, we find the phrase, it is the good war that hallows every cause. The good war that hallows every cause. And this statement made in part one is considered worthy of being quoted back to Zarathustra in part four. We're told we find this everything twice in the text. The good war which hallows every cause. You should love peace as a means to new wars. And you should love the short peace more than the long. Thus speaks Zarathustra. And again, that's another maxim considered worthy of being uh, quoted back. Why should, we, why should this be the case? Why should you love peace as a means to new wars? Because in Zarathustra's words, war and courage have done more great things than charity. But of course, we need to ask, what kind of a war is it that Zarathustra is advocating? Again, the answers lie in the text, I think, when we look at it. And we can be clear about it. You should seek your enemy, Zarathustra tells us. You should wage your war, a war for your beliefs, for eure Gedanken, for your thoughts, your opinions, or your beliefs. I think the argument here is, is that if you're not prepared to commit to defending your beliefs, are they really worth it? Sacrifice is necessary to give something value. And so it is this very particular kind of war that Nietzsche is talking about. This is the kind of war of which in the Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche says, one has renounced grand life when one renounces war. It's the grand life. It's not the war that's important, it's the war that's important to the grand life. And this is the case, and it's only the case, because, as Nietzsche tells us, one is fruitful only at the cost of being rich in contradictions. One's fruitful only at the cost of being rich in contradictions. Such a notion, then, is intimately bound up with Nietzsche's conception of freedom. He says, war is a training in freedom. War is a training in freedom. For what is freedom? That one has the will to self-responsibility. The free man is a warrior. And against this background, I think it becomes clear why in Etsy Homo, Nietzsche says of himself, I am by nature warlike. I am by nature warlike, he says. A statement reformulated in his vivid declaration, I'm not a man, I'm dynamite. And I think, well, I know, but look at him, just a man with a very big moustache. And, and yet, it's not so much, I think, the, uh, the misuse to which Nietzsche has been uh, put that uh, makes one marvel at the possible truth of what he's saying. It's the possibilities that still lie within his thought to create something which he calls 
the grand life. That really would be a dynamite kind of explosion that would change the way we think about ourselves and the world. In an apparently prophetic moment, an apparently prophetic moment in Etsy Homo, Nietzsche tells us there will be wars such as there have never yet been on Earth. Again, that sounds like some terrible prophecy of what will happen in the 20th century. But look again at the context. The condition for this prediction is that such wars will only take place when truth steps into battle with the lie of millennia. That's the level in which wars taking place. It's not one country invading another. It's truth in battle with the lie of millennia. It's really important, I think, to make this distinction. The hardness that Nietzsche is talking about is not, is not the hardness that we find, say, Hitler talking about in a notorious speech where he talks about Germany being fast as a greyhound, tough as leather, hard as cropped steel. That's not what Nietzsche means. What Nietzsche, I mean, that is a heroic hardness which excludes any kind of pathos. Rather with Nietzsche, we're talking about a hardness, a heroic hardness that does not exclude weakness. As François Fétier, who I'm following in this interpretation, observes, Achilles is heroic, but that does not stop him dying when his heel is struck by the arrow of Paris. Only someone who can perish can be hard. And someone hard is only hard because that person can perish. Thus hardness and its opposite, gentleness if you will, tenderness if you will, are by no means mutually exclusive. The hardness of which Nietzsche is speaking is not, is not a hardness of the heart. Rather, this heart acquires hardness because it is gentle, and this gentleness because it is hard, in the sense that Friedrich Hölderli, cited by François Fédier, says in a letter to Christian, Christian Landau in 1801, only in absolute power is there absolute love. Only in absolute power is there absolute love. He says, ich fühle es endlich nur in ganzer Kraft. Is ganze Liebe. And again, I'm trying to make a link between this passage and Zarathustra's remark uh, yesterday that our virtue has its origin in the beginning when our will wants to command all things as the will of a lover. Now, it's true that Nietzsche is not alone in the 19th century regarding war as a potential for rejuvenation. There's a big discourse in it, but we have to see Nietzsche as picking up this discourse and writing against it. That, that's what he's doing. For example, we might think all of these kind of comments that Nietzsche's making about, about war are out of, uh, are out of step, but he, he's in fact reacting, reacting against the discourse that we find, for example, in um, Jakob Burkhardt, Nietzsche's contemporary in Basel, the cultural historian Jakob Burkhardt, who talks in the reflections on history about war being a necessary factor of high development. That's what Borkhardt looks at. Borkhardt talks about how, through the abolition of an old order by a really vital new one, war can bring about, as he puts it, a real regeneration of life. And Borkhardt really is, I think, pushing the neocon line here. Uh, but he also is, in Borkhardt's uh, uh, view at any rate, that by bringing into play the full forces of despair, war such as the Greek Persian War that so fascinated Nietzsche and the birth of tragedy was to exercise a rejuvenating and revitalizing force. Yet again, is this what Nietzsche means when he talks about war? I think not. 